I'm Tony Bruski. Welcome. We hope you've enjoyed our coverage on the trial of Alec Murdoch. This is a look back at some of the key moments and conversations that we've had over the last several weeks regarding the case. This is continuing coverage in the trial of Alex Murdoch from True Crime Today. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Tony Bruski. Today, we're going to be joined by former prosecutor Lori Gilbertson. We're going to talk in depth about what is going on, what the behaviors that we've witnessed from uh, Alec Murdoch in the trial, in the uh, police interrogation video, what all that may mean when you break it down, or does it mean much at all? Everyone has different responses to trauma. One simply looking at the way one behaved when being questioned after a tragedy took place. Uh, Innocent people, guilty people, they all perform very differently on an individual level. We're going to go into that. But first, uh, Lori, I want to talk to you about experience as a prosecutor. What is it like when you go into a setting such as the one in the low country of South Carolina, where it's literally a family dynasty of prosecutors and solicitors that have been there for nearly 100 years. And that reputation, that control, if you will, still lingering. How difficult is it to go in as a prosecutor to try a case against someone that had so much power? Yeah, it it really is so intertwined, you know, both uh, on the surface Uh, and below the surface. So, you know, as a prosecutor, you want to be sure that when you are presenting your case, uh, you are really doing it in such a way that you are presenting a total picture to the jury that is really as separate as you can be from any of that, unless there has been some influence and that's something that you want to bring up. Obviously, you cannot hide who he is. Um, And in fact, you know, it's one of those things that uh, you like to look at as a prosecutor where there may be something in your case where you might think of as a weakness. Like here is this defendant uh, who has had ties to the law enforcement community through this kind of family dynasty for nearly a hundred years. You know, a defense attorney may say, you know, he, he is, uh, he's a law abiding person. In fact, he's the one who represented the law, who brought the, the law and brought other people to justice. How on earth could that person be guilty of this double murder? As a prosecutor, you can kind of take that and say, well, that's not actually a weakness for our case. That's a strength. Here is someone who knows how the law worked and who, through all his dealings with it, has started to feel that he is somewhat above it and that he is someone who can manipulate it and use it and use the power of it to benefit himself and his family, which is something that when you look at the history of things going on in his family before this a double murder and all the things, you know, that his sons have been accused of. And then, of course, the the crazy case of, of him paying someone to shoot him in the head. You know, it shows a pattern of that, of, of utter disregard for the law and a real uh, proclivity to use it when it benefits them mm-hmm. and not want to be held to the consequences of their actions when it doesn't. So if that starts to come in, I think as a prosecutor, you you can weave that in. The other thing you really want to do is in some way you are treating him like any other defendant and you are bringing your case in the most clear cut way to paint a picture for the jury of exactly what happened. And you are taking out to the best that you can do any distractions. And the fact that they have a history going back 100 years until it becomes an issue could just be a distraction. And it looks like in this case, I think we're into to maybe the, the fifth day, Tony, or maybe a little more yeah. of testimony. What the prosecutors here are doing is starting out with the crime scene, with the forensic and physical evidence, and starting to really paint this picture for the jury and put them there at that scene. And it doesn't matter uh, any kind of history with law enforcement at that point when you are painting that picture and you are really, really uh, taking pains to show that things were done exactly right and that that evidence can be relied upon. Is the jury able to get more context on the individual uh, in in question here? This case, obviously, being Alec Murdoch, in terms of yeah. everything else that he's been accused of, all the way from the financial crimes to the the boat accident, which obviously involved his son, to the the housekeeper maid nanny 
who died under somewhat mysterious circumstances, and then he pocketed all the money. Are those other pieces that can go into this to help paint a better picture of who he is or who he was? You know, Tony, as you are saying that, I am almost starting to laugh because it sounds like it's made up Mm -hmm. in some way. You know, I, reading about the housekeeper brings to mind um, the documentary, The Staircase. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Very. it or your listeners are about, you know, somewhat uh, a wife dying in that particular way and everything that came from it. So what whether these things come in or not uh, is really up to the judge. You start that way. Uh, prosecutors can bring in evidence of prior bad acts. Uh, when they relate and are relevant to certain things in a trial, uh, things like motive, intent, the manner in which a crime was a, a crime occurred or was committed, the identity of the person who did it, or a common scheme or plan, meaning there may have been prior crimes that exactly matched this one, sometimes tried together, sometimes tried separately. And ultimately, the judge needs to weigh, is this more probative? You know, is it really more relevant? Is it really going to help the jury and show them something relating to their determination of fact in this case? Or is it more prejudicial? Is this going to harm the defendant to such a point where they're not going to be really determining the facts of this case? They're going to possibly be thinking, well, he's such a bad guy. He's accused of so many things. He may have been proven guilty of so many things. He must have done this, too. And that's a balancing act for the judge. So it ha- can happen in a couple different ways. Often, if a prosecutor wants to bring in any of these uh, past bad acts or past crimes, the prosecutor makes a motion before trial for these things to come in. Often, the judge will either have uh, briefs on it from both sides. Both sides get to argue it. Sometimes there's a hearing, and then the judge makes a decision on those things. You know, another way that things can come in is if the defense opens the door to it. You know, Mm -hmm. if through their cross examination of various witnesses, they open the door to something where it would not be fair for the jury not to have some of this information, where they'd have an incomplete picture that would cause prejudice in their fact-finding mission. So Mm -hmm. that's another way it can come in. Um, With the exception of the things that I mentioned, the motive, intent, the manner of the crime, a common scheme or plan, the identity, with the exception of those things, uh, crimes that really go to dishonesty, that go to something like fraud, which he's been, uh, I think, accused of Mm -hmm. and maybe convicted of those things, that really goes to the defendant's credibility. So if he were to take the stand, there would also be most likely a hearing before that on what the prosecution would be allowed to cross-examine him on. And the reason that those crimes or those bad acts would be admitted is because the jury's determining his credibility, whether or not he's telling them the truth. So if other things where he has been incredibly dishonest uh, have happened, often the judge will rule it is fair for the jury to consider those things when as it pertains to his credibility. Uh, Yeah. And and also on on the stand, the defense can open the door. Mm -hmm. And if they open the door to something, meaning if they question about something where the jury then deserves to to have a full and fair context of everything, Often the judge will let the prosecution just walk right through it and possibly bring in things that may have been the judge may have ruled couldn't come in. This is a man who obviously comes from generations of people who know how to work a courtroom, know how to uh, handle people and convince them one way or the other. He was very successful himself when he was practicing. So this is someone who's not a stranger to a courtroom or, or how to to get by. Is it? ever a good idea for someone like this specifically uh, to be on the stand testifying, uh, whether for the defense or the prosecution? Wow. Well, in this case, uh, with everything uh, in his past, Mm -hmm. uh, with all of the things that would most likely come in, I, as a defense attorney, I think you'd would be dealing with a ticking time bomb to put him on the stand. Yeah. I think that could be a very, very dangerous thing because you are truly opening the door to so many things that he can be questioned about, um, let alone 
you know, the actual murders in question Mm -hmm. here and the evidence that the prosecution has. And there would also, you would think, be some expectation of him testifying in a certain way where there would be this almost expectation from the the jury uh, because he was a prosecutor, because he was a lawyer of having this kind of innate sense of the courtroom and their expectations might be very high for him mm-hmm. uh, if he were to take the stand. And that might, that could definitely be something that would be very hard uh, for a defense attorney to, uh, to really navigate. And I think he'd be an incredibly difficult, difficult defendant to put on the stand in a case like this. The optics so far, I mean, he's been hitting most of the cues, it seems cry mm-hmm. here and, uh, look really, I mean, he, he's been doing a, a good job at it, but I mean, and if it's true emotion because he is innocent, if that is the case, one would understand it. One could also totally understand he knows when to pull those cards as well. What have you made of the emotions that have been expressed thus far in court from Alec Murdoch? Yeah, I, I mean, looking at it from a prosecutor's point of view, it it looks a lot to me like he is trying to testify without testifying, mm-hmm. kind of trying to speak without the uh, opportunity for anyone to cross-examine him. And he gets to put on a little show there mm-hmm. for the jury. And it it rings false to me. It may be ringing in a totally different way mm-hmm. to this jury. And maybe they need to, you know, when they get further into the evidence, they'll see it. But I... I, I do find those kinds of displays when they are as overt uh, as his have been mm-hmm. just have just a ring of falseness to them, a ring of acting to them. And, and, and not to sound cold, but I mean, this mm-hmm. is something it's not like this crime occurred last week. Um, right. uh, one would, you know, I, I mean, if if my wife and, and child were murdered, I would probably be breaking down in tears for the rest of my life when it's brought up to a certain extent. But at the same point, you're preparing for this. You know what's going to be happening. You know what's going to be presented in court. Um, You know, does one naturally react that way when this has already been, you know, hashed over in your mind a thousand times? Uh, Or is this part of the strategy of like, look, I you need to cry at this moment in time? Yeah, you know, as you said here, this is a defendant who is well aware of what optics are to the jury, who has been in a courtroom for, Mm -hmm. you know, his entire legal career, who was, you know, as you say, by all accounts, a very good trial lawyer. So he knows how that works. And I don't think anybody needs to, you know, doesn't really need to be telling him to show emotion or not show emotion. It, It sounds like, you know, in his mind, it in turn in terms of showing this emotion he would truly believe that it would be helping his case in mm-hmm. front of the jury and when we say w- how would one react you know there's often a danger in uh in generalizing how sure. people react some people do some people don't um it, it's hard to generalize but what the jury can do and and you know what we do looking at it is just just look at it in the totality of the circumstances look at when that emotion is coming out and then look back at how he behaved and what his actions were both before during and after the double murder of his wife and his son and i would imagine that uh should he not testify and should he continue with some of, of this emotion this open emotion that that may be something the prosecutor touches on uh when they ultimately get to talk to the jury in their closing argument how common is it when someone is being interviewed by police uh the day a crime occurred I, he sat down in mm-hmm. uh the squad car and they were you know asking him his story that video just released uh to Obviously, he showed a lot of emotion there, no visible tears, a lot of, you know, very, oh, my gosh, uh, you know, turning over, covering his eyes, but then very quickly being able to answer other questions, it seemed almost kind of scarily uh, how much it went from one side to the other. But it's trauma. Everyone does grieve differently. It's hard to to really gauge if you know what's right and what's wrong because there really isn't a right and wrong. But how often is it when someone is being questioned that they immediately have a uh, or at least directions that they're going to start pointing the authorities because that's what seemed to happen in that car it was 
well, th- we've been uh, persecuted for this with the boat crash, and there's been threats and this. And then we had this other guy who I just hired, and he's kind of weird, but I really don't think it's him, uh, to immediately be yeah. pointing fingers literally within hours of your wife and son, and you just saw your son's brains on the wall. I mean, I, I don't think I'd be even able to speak at that moment in time, more or less yeah. conjure up stories. That's just me, though. In a calm manner, the way it was uh, delivered is uh, is that common? I don't know if common is even a, a thing when we're talking about something like this. Yeah, like you said, tra- people react to trauma in all different ways. Uh, I think your reaction, you know, your your what you're saying would have been your reaction, which I think would be most people's. Yeah. The question is, is this a reaction of someone who has just committed double murders <laughs> and is speaking with the police and immediately trying to point them in all different directions that mm-hmm. would lead away from himself? Or is this the reaction of uh, a husband somewhat estranged from his wife, but still speaking, who has come back and and found his husband, uh, found his uh, wife and his son in this condition? You know, so who is really having this reaction? Yeah. Who is the person who's doing this? What are the circumstances that surround it? When you ask if it's common, like you said, everybody uh, grieves and reacts to trauma in different ways. That alone is not necessarily kind of that indicia of guilt, that thing that's saying this is a guilty guy. You know, there used to be these sayings, you know, when I would go speak to defendants in the in the police station, like, oh, well, if he's in the cell and he went to sleep, that means he's guilty because he's not worried about anything. Mm -hmm. Or if he's awake and he's wandering around and pacing, that means he's uh, then he's not guilty because he's worried. And look, you, you just take that stuff and you put it in along with everything else, and then make a decision about what you are thinking of this reaction. So in terms of that reaction, I mean, I um, dealt with a lot of very traumatized people. And uh, the general reaction is is not as kind of um, collected and information filled as his interrogation was. So, yeah, I mean, we we have to yeah, think about where it's coming from. And, and and that too, think of where it's coming from because he would know like what are the police going to want and need. And if you are wanting to find the killer of your wife and child, I, I could see being a little more collected and being able to get that out and, and communicate effectively more so than just the average person because you already know that world and what they'd right. be wanting to hear. And that but. may be, uh, you know, an argument that the defense will make that that is why this was his reaction to trauma and the same kind of things that we're talking about. Everybody reacts differently. When you look at it from the other side, uh, in the light of all of the circumstances, the prosecutor could certainly say this is not the way that someone who has just seen their son's brains completely blown out uh, and lying on the floor next to him reacts. It is just not a uh, humanly... Re- human uh, reaction to trauma <laughs> yeah. uh, to immediately the react the way that he did. Lori Gilbertson, former prosecutor. Thank you so much for your insight. Lori Gilbertson, also the head of Tribeca Blue Consulting, the link you can find in our episode notes. And that's going to do it for this edition of the program. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts so you don't miss any of our episodes and breaking updates. You can get a commercial free experience through Apple Podcasts when you subscribe there. You can try it out for three days free. You can follow me on Twitter at Tony B Pod. I'm Tony Bruschi for all of us. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.